10 pounds heavier. That's what we are. You know where that came from, don't you? It came from you right before the show. Well, it came from Jerry Lawler in 1976 when, no, it was 75, I believe, when old Ron Fuller, the Tennessee stud, came back to Memphis to challenge the king. And Jerry Lawler came out there, and, and Lance Russell said, well, I want you to know, King, that Ron Fuller is back 6'9", 265. He's 10 pounds heavier. And Jerry Lawler said, well, you take that 265 pounds, and you distribute it over that 6'9"-inch frame of Ron Fuller's. His feet are size 20s. So that takes about 200 of those pounds right there. And you take the rest of those 65 pounds, you distribute it over that 6'9". He's got a neck like a stack of dimes. He looks like a whooping crane. And I'm going to take that stack of dimes neck, and I'm going to thump it, and I'm going to break the Tennessee stud in half. That's what Jerry Lawler said. Of course, it wasn't, it wasn't that easy when he got in the ring. <laughs> no, no, certainly not. And, of course, we've all seen Jerry Lawler out of character talk, and he's a very mild-mannered, simple guy. I shouldn't say simple, but simple. he says things he's very simple. He's calling the king simple-minded. He's a simple-minded king. No, no, he's a, he's a very, you know, mild-mannered kind of guy. And it makes me wonder, when you hear about promos like that, what did someone who, like, sat next to him in art class in high school think when they turned on the TV? <laughs> and here's that quiet Jerry Law was always drawing those funny pictures, yelling about how he's going to, you know kill ron fuller i don't well i don't know if lawler was ever that quiet probably especially in school he it strikes me as the class cut up uh that he would have been i don't know i wasn't uh That's i wasn't true. there in school with the king but but he was more mild-mannered before he got in wrestling and and the thing is it i wonder what sometimes when jerry jarrett would bring in all those top stars from around the country to when he was building lawler to into one of the top 10 box office attractions and jerry jarrett took a guy who had tremendous talent had his first match in November of 1970. 18 months later, Jared had already sent him down to Alabama, some of the small territories to get some experience where they teamed him up with Jim White and he first met Sam Bass, brought him back at the end of 72. So two years into his career, and at the time he was 22 years old, and Jerry Lawler and Jim White as a team with Sam Bass as a manager set the attendance record at the Mid South Coliseum in 1973. They had a string of several sellouts, big houses, and by 1974, Lawler wasn't 25 years old yet. And Jarrett pushed him into one of the top 10 box office attractions in the country, bringing all those top guys in to face him in Memphis, going for Jack Briscoe for the world title. But I had to wonder what all a Dick the Bruiser and the Sheik. And all those guys thought when they had to come into Memphis and none of them would do a job. If you, if you go back and look, the only one that would do a job for Lawler that was outside the territory was Bobo Brazil because he had worked there in the ter- Besides that, Bobo knew, knew business. He knew what he was there for. Um, but he had worked the territory and seen how over Lawler was. But can you imagine telling Bruiser, okay, this kid you've never heard of. We want to get him over some kind of way, even disqualification and, you know, Sheik was a DQ and et cetera, blah, blah, blah. But when Lawler would just verbally eviscerate those fucking guys, I I can't imagine that it was a different time then. Somebody didn't want to just punch him in the fucking face. I'm sure he he caught quite a few potatoes in the, in the summer of 74 from some of these big names. You know, something you just uh, talked about there reminds me of a conversation I had with Scott Bowden on Kentucky Fried Wrestling, where we played a lot of the classic audio when discussing it. but. You know, Jerry Jarrett, I don't know if he gets enough credit. I think maybe there have been some false narratives put out there recently so that people maybe don't take a real look and really understand just what he did, especially with Jerry Lawler. You know, when you look at Roman Reigns, a guy who they really wanted to be the top guy and they did everything they could to the best of their ability and it did not work out, Jerry Jarrett saw in Jerry Lawler a diamond in the rough. And he was. You see those early pictures of him. He's really skinny. He doesn't have a look yet. And look at what he became just a couple years later, let alone four years later, six years later. Jerry Jarrett deserves so much credit for really just nurturing Lawler. Well, the the thing is also, you got to remember, Jarrett picked Lawler because he could talk and because in his matches, he knew what to do. It didn't matter what he looked like. And the emphasis wasn't on the body in those days like it is now, but... Because Lawler just was a natural and just, I guess, because of his, he's such a great artist. He had the hand to eye coordination, but also he knew what to do. He knew when to get on somebody, when to take the bumps, when to be a chicken shit, when to be an asshole. He could talk like crazy almost from the start. And so where they, you know, fell by the wayside, Roman Reigns is no Jerry Lawler. He looks great. And, and I haven't seen that many of his matches, but he seems like he can work, but he's not a, 
a, a, a prodigy ring general that could, you know, really lead a match by the time he was 25 years old. And he definitely, he's not the promo, but that's not an insult against Roman Reigns. Nobody could talk like Lawler could talk. Lawler can't even talk like Lawler could talk in those days still. I mean, we're all older. But Jarrett saw that this guy could attract attention, both positive and negative, depending on the spot he was put in. And also because he was from Memphis, Memphis had never – they had had hometown – Billy Wicks was the last hometown hero that Memphis had had. Jackie Fargo was not from Memphis. He just made it his home. All those other you know, top baby faces and top heels that they had, Sputnik Monroe was not from Memphis. So Lawler was the first hometown guy, and Memphis was the magic town. But once again, as I've said before, the population of Shelby County, Tennessee in 1974 was 750,000 people. For the Memphis metropolitan area, they sold 400,000 tickets to wrestling events that year. 50 events in the Mid-South Coliseum. Lawler was on the top of most of them, and the ones he wasn't on top of didn't really draw that well. So it skewed the average. So, you know, New York City, to do the same thing, per capita population, would have had to run 50 shows at Madison Square Garden and drawn 90,000 people for each. So, you know, that a lot of people don't understand, getting back to your point, that what a genius Jarrett was because he knew personal issues draw money. That's what the sign that they all had, Lawler, Dundee, Jarrett, everybody had above their desks with personal issues draw money because that was the key to the Tennessee Territory. You didn't have a major population centers in the towns in that territory. You didn't have big national name stars most of the time because the Tennessee territory was notoriously cheap for its payoffs unless you were a homesteader and, you know, and, you know, built, built your uh, name and reputation there. Then you can make a fortune. So, and he had to draw weekly, not monthly. So Jerry Jarrett, when he started booking in the late sixties in Memphis, Business had been good. They had a string of sellouts at the Ellis Auditorium with the Blue Infernos in, I think, 66 or 67, um, which is when Lawler started drawing the pictures and sending them into Lance. But when they, when Jarrett took over, he really brought it – he modernized the, uh, the, the style of the territory and the style of the TV, and that's why Nick's end – Nashville, Birmingham, Chattanooga, where Lynn Rossi or whoever he had booking was doing it the old way. And it's it was more primitive and the TVs weren't as exciting and the angles weren't as as you know, they were hot, but they weren't as fresh. And over on the Memphis end, Jarrett not only revitalized Memphis and then they moved to the Mid South Coliseum and a year after they moved there he sold it out. Um but he built Louisville from scratch, had been dead. And it was, you know, filling up the gardens within the first year and Evansville, Indiana and Lexington, Lexington, Kentucky, on and off, depending on the TV situation. So he not only went in and revitalized a town that had been running for years, but he also built towns from scratch. And it was all because he had a way. And if if it didn't work, he'd cut it off, shoot an angle. First couple of weeks, it don't draw. Well, fuck them. We're going to do something else. And he would go uh, in another direction. But he maintain that week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out from the late 60s to be in the last territory to fold in the late 90s when actually Jarrett was out of the business by that point. And he had told me in 1991 when we went in there with the fabs, he said, uh, he said a year ago, I had an account for wrestling with $250,000 in it. Now it has $150,000 in it. I don't intend to lose any more money. <laughs> Because by that time he was getting into construction and other things, and uh, and so they ran on a budget, and they and then Randy Hales got in there and he kind of revitalized things in the mid '90s and had some good houses in Louisville and, and Memphis, but uh, but they not only drew bigger than most territories for a period of time, especially in the '70s and '80s when Lawler was hot, but they were the last ones to stick around because that's why Vince wanted Jarrett to run the fucking WWF if he went to prison. Because he's the only one that he could trust. He knew Jarrett didn't want to take it away from him. But at the same time, he knew that he wouldn't fucking, you know, let anything stupid happen to where it would, you know, go out of business by the time Vince got sprung. And then I think they were both happy when Vince didn't go to jail and Jarrett got to go back to Tennessee. Because Jerry told me he was living in that condo they had for him in Stamp. They had a building. I spent three months there. It was like a very well-appointed prison cell. 
they had a a building they'd give you a condo when you first moved up there and Jarrett was drinking fucking two bottles of wine a night and Jerry Jarrett's not been, never been a heavy drinker but he was just miserable up there in Connecticut as everybody was that that you know that went from the south to the north that's the same place I did. Bill Watts, when he left, he, he shit in a, a undisclosed location in a condo and left it just as a present for him. <laughs> uh, he was in his 50s at, by that point. Well, that's what he thought. I'm telling you, this play, it was in downtown Stamford. You had to, to drive through downtown Stamford to get home. You had to go in the parking garage and you had to have a key, one of those key cards to get in the parking garage, right? Then you go up to whatever fucking floor you can find a spot to park in. I know. I think we had a spot. I think we had a we had two spots that came along with our <laughs> our living, uh, you know, uh, arrangements. But then you had to have a key to get in the door to get to the elevator. Then you had to go down to the lobby in the elevator, no matter which floor you parked on in the garage, and pass by a manned doorman station that was there twenty four hours a day. So that they could make sure that I guess that, you know, Shiite Muslim terrorists weren't fucking coming in. Then you had to get in another elevator and go up to your floor. And then you had to have two keys to get in your goddamn door. And it, you know, oh my God, it was like, it was literally like I'd never even lived in town before, right? Never in a city where there was actually, you know, parking meters and shit outside my fucking abode. But to go through all that, it was like going to fucking jail where you had the coming and going privileges. So, yeah, so Jared was becoming a wine drinker. I was having violent episodes. Watts left a hidden turd. <laughs> all, of, all the Southern people that went up there, it just, it was fucking brutal. Just fucking brutal. I, re- I was uncomfortable enough living in apartments. I lived in apartments. The only time in my life I ever lived in an apartment was from 1983 when I got into business in Nashville. And then I had one in, in Atlanta briefly. And then Louisiana, two different places there because I was there for a year. And then uh, Dallas and then Charlotte. And then in 87, so four years later, when I'm in Charlotte for good, then I, I moved into a, a house that I'd rented. It's, but four years I spent, I, that was the most nerve-wracking. I wasn't used to having people I didn't know living in the same structure as me. It was so fucking confining and claustrophobic and nerve-wracking. 